10 years ago, my life was considered normal, that normal everyday parent. And when I say normal, I really mean chaos because there's absolutely nothing normal about parenting. It's chaotic every day. But I did the typical things. You know, I took my girls back and forth to their friends and to schools. I took them to different activities, helped with homework, cooked dinner, you know, separated them when they fought every minute. Those things we do every day and we take for granted. But on October 16th of 2006, that all changed. That morning, my daughter Megan and I were talking about her 14th birthday party. She was getting ready to go to school. She had her birthday invitations together, and she had been planning this. She was so excited. It was this amazing morning. But 24 hours later, I was planning Megan's funeral. Megan had taken her own life. She hanged herself from her bedroom closet. Megan was a victim of cyberbullying. I will tell you, from that moment and that day, I will never be the same parent again. I will never have that normal life. You know, I think about Megan every moment of every day, but I realize nothing I can do will bring Megan back. And so what I wanted to do was be able to share Megan's story with the world in hopes to create change create and, and share with you all of the things that I have learned, which are things such as validating and listening to what kids are going through. That is something that I have learned that my hope is to share with you. You know, Megan wasn't alone. 160,000 kids miss school every day due to bullying. And what kids overwhelmingly say they need from us as adults is for us to listen and validate how they feel. When we don't do that, they feel unheard. They feel that we don't care. So how did I end up here, this mom from St. Louis, you know, traveling across the country and speaking about this topic? It was my daughter, Megan. You know, Megan was this girl born on November 6th of 1992, and she was this amazing kid. But from kindergarten, Megan struggled with her self-esteem. She had girls who told her that her legs were too big, that she was tall like a giant. It was as if every negative thing that people said about her, Megan took those words, put them on her, and wore them as a badge. And as a parent, no matter how much I told her, honey, you're beautiful, don't worry about them, it still she compared herself to other kids. Megan now enters third grade, and she was diagnosed with depression and attention deficit disorder. And then Megan enters middle school. Seventh grade was horrible. Megan now had boys who started stomping behind her in the lunch line, calling her a fat cow and an elephant, making animal noises, to the point that Megan stopped eating lunch. She wasn't signing out for gym now because you have to put on shorts and t-shirts, you know, so they would make fun of her legs. Her grades were dropping. The kid cried every morning going to school, every afternoon picking her up. And as a parent, I didn't know what to do. So we finally switched her to a different school for her eighth grade year. It wasn't because we thought that school was horrible, but Megan just needed a fresh start. Going into that eighth grade year, things were phenomenal. Megan was back to being goofy and funny and laughing, going to slumber parties, going to the movies, doing those typical things 13, 14-year-old kids do. And it was a huge relief as parents. But then again, of course, what came in eighth grade was, Mom, I have to have a MySpace account. Everybody has a MySpace account. Of course, they say everybody has everything, right? That's supposed to make it easier for us. I did let Megan have the MySpace account, but I had a lot of strict rules in place. I mean, I was one of those moms that monitored everything. Megan started adding friends from her old school and friends from her new school, and things were going really well. And about three weeks later, Megan was befriended by a boy by the name of Josh Evans. Megan thought this boy was hot and begged to add him, and those were Megan's words. This kid loved boys from preschool to, to eighth grade. She always thought they were cute and hot, so this was nothing new for her. And I always thought, you know, these other girls go through the yucky boy stage, not her. So Josh and Megan started talking. Josh told Megan she was beautiful and had beautiful eyes and a great smile. Megan thought he was cute. And believe me, as parents sitting out there, I did monitor this. It was not something that I just kind of let go on. You know, and the other thing is, is that Megan was happy. And wasn't just happy because of this Josh Evans account. She wasn't the kid that sat in the corner and just waited to talk to him. She was hanging out with friends, doing great things, but this boy was telling her nice things. 
And I was happy as a mom to see her finally fitting in with other kids. That, to me, was amazing. But that didn't last very long, unfortunately. After five weeks of talking back and forth, now Josh sent Megan a message that said, I don't want to be friends with you anymore. You're not a nice person. Megan said, what are you talking about? Where is this coming from? I am nice. He said, no one likes you. No one wants to be friends with you. And then he got two other girls involved. These messages went back and forth. They were mean and cruel and humiliating. And Megan was not the one that just, they were saying it to her. Megan was now defending herself. She was now fighting back, saying, I'm not this, you're this. The mean names that were going out about Megan said, Megan Meyer is a fat ass, Megan Meyer is a whore, and those were about the nicest words. I, as a parent, went to the computer. She was sobbing, and I told her to get up. I looked at these messages going all over. I said, Megan, honey, come on. I told you the war of words never works. If you would have signed off when I told you to, we could have dealt with this differently. I said, honey, you're not any of these things that they're calling you. And she said, mom, who's going to believe me? They're going to believe them. It's going to everybody at my old school, everybody at my new school. No one's going to believe me. Her last words were to me, or to me were, you're supposed to be my mom. You're supposed to be on my side. And she took off running upstairs to her room. 20 minutes later, I just had this horrible feeling that ran through my entire body. I ran upstairs to Megan's room, opened the door, and I found Megan hanging in her closet. The paramedics transported Megan to Children's Hospital, but 24 hours later, Megan passed away. I will tell you, sometimes saying this, and it comes out of my mouth, as many times as I've said it, I still can shake my head thinking, I can't believe this is my life sometimes. But these things can happen. Five weeks after Megan passed away, we found out that Josh Evans account, that cute boy that Megan liked, Josh was fake. Josh never existed. Josh was really a mom who lived four houses down the street. It was her daughter, who was 13 years old, who had been friends with Megan since the fourth grade, and another 18-year-old girl. They created this account because the mom heard that Megan was talking about her daughter behind her back. So the mom thought this would be a great way to see if that's really happening. You know, I truly don't believe from the bottom of my heart that this family knew Megan was going to take her own life. They thought it was a joke. They thought it was funny. But this is the reality. These are the tragedies that can happen. And I always say to people, when you create fake accounts just as a joke, you don't know what that person's going through. Do you know what their life is, their home life? Because we keep those things hidden. We only tell very few people about the real things we're going through. When you say those things and you think on social media and it's anonymous, you still can cause a person to really struggle with what you're saying. Words are hurtful. They impact people. You know, I will tell you, though, if I had to stay in that place of anger and sadness and the why me's every day, I don't think I could function or get out of bed. It was too much of a burden to carry. So what I had to do was do something about this, which is I created the Megan Meyer Foundation in December of 2007. And our mission is to support and inspire actions to end bullying and cyberbullying. You know, I've had this phenomenal ability to be able to travel across the country and speak to tens of thousands of students to find out what they're going through, what's working, what's not working, what do they wish adults knew how to support them through all of this? What kids overwhelmingly say is they need adults to listen to them, validate how they feel. Really, thinking about it in this audience today, don't we want people to understand just our feelings? It might not make sense to them, but just understand how I feel. That's what kids need. I've asked kids, and they'll say, listen, my parents either yell or scream, they either tell me to ignore it, they will say, you know what, I'm going to go in and fix it. And then they say they act crazy because then they overreact. They will say, you know what, listen, they tell us what to do, what we shouldn't have done, what they would have done. They said, but what they fail to do so many times is really hear us. And that's why we know that 75% of kids do not tell a trusted adult when they're struggling through these issues. To be quite honest, I was one of those parents. 
I was that parent with Megan that I was either going to, you know, just ignore it or, or I was going to be the fixer. I'm the mom, you know, I have the answers. I have the life experience. And I will tell you, I remember one time in middle school when Megan was struggling quite a bit. And I told her, honey, just ignore those boys. If you ignore them, they'll get bored and tired. They'll move on. Megan looked at me and said, mom, could you really do that if it was you? I said, Megan, you're right. I mean, I as an adult would really have a hard time having people say things to me, and then all of a sudden, you know, just don't worry about it, go back to work and be normal. The other thing I said to her is, you're right, Megan, guess what? I'm going to go to the school. I'm going to fix this. That child grabbed me by the arm and almost shook me and begged me, Mom, please don't go to the school. You don't get it. You're going to make it 10 times worse. It is hard raising kids in our world today, I will tell you. But what we have an ability and the beauty of our world is this. We are able to learn through people's experiences, their tragedies and their triumphs, and we can make changes in our life. And those are the things that I hope to be able to bring to you today, is changing that for you and understanding the powerful world, words of listening and validating kids. Parents in the audience, I want you to be able to ask your kids, am I a good listener? They may look at you like you're crazy. They'll probably laugh because they understand that sometimes we don't listen very well, right? But here's what you can do. The next time a situation arises, Go sit down with your child. Duct tape your mouth if you need to. It doesn't matter whatever you need to do. Please don't interject. Sit, listen to them, put your cell phones down. Put your work away. Push dinner off for a couple of hours. Order out whatever you need to do. But listen to what they say. And when they're done, then validate their feelings. You're not validating their behaviors or their actions. All you're validating is just their feelings. They then can calm down and talk to you more. You can then calm down, and you can start working on a resolution much better. For educators and teachers here, you have an ability within your own classroom to create a climate of acceptance, to create a climate where students know they can come and talk to you. Again, we always focus so much on the way that they're behaving or their actions. All we want to do is validate their feelings and listen to them, and then it helps them calm down. And for students, you guys have the most power in the world to make changes for yourselves and within that school. You sometimes fail to see it. Traveling across this country and speaking to students, I am able to sit down on the ground in kindergarten circles, which is amazing ability to connect with kids. And when I ask them, listen, how many of you have ever struggled with bullying or know somebody? the majority of kids will raise their hands. I say, listen, if you were in that situation and you had a really caring, loving, trusted adult, or you had a student, whether you know that student or not, how many of you would want that adult to stand up for you in that situation? Very few kids raise their hands, and this is across the country. When I say another student, whether you know that student or not, those students raise their hands, and I tell them, look around. The thing is, another student doing this, it's the one that makes them feel like, guess what? They understand me. They get it. It's their peers. So students, you have this ability. And what research shows is that when another student intervenes, within 10 seconds, it can stop that situation. That is powerful. You know, recently at a presentation, I had a high school senior. The boy came up to me and said that he was really struggling. He said that, you know, it was on social media, it was in person, and he said he didn't know where to go, what to do, but his friends saw that he was struggling. He said they kept asking him, are you okay? Come hang out with me. They stood up against the, the bullies when this was happening. He said, I don't know if I would be here today without them. That's the power that kids have. We all have an ability to end bullying when parents and when educators become better listeners, and when they validate kids' feelings, when students are able to stand up for every single one of their classmates, every single one of you has a Megan Meyer in your classroom, every single one of you. When adults listen, when students are empowered to stand up and intervene, we can change a person's life. We might even save a person's life, and how amazing that would that be? Thank you.